All right, so we'll take the first look at general defences by looking at intoxication. And um, intoxication is a relatively straightforward uh, defence to discuss and understand. So I'll do my best not to try and make it more difficult than it actually is. And I'm going to split this into two, um, partly because of the time that I'm allowed. And I just want to get the basic rules and principles in the first video so as you understand them. And then we'll start to look at some of the more complex stuff, perhaps in, in the second video. So the first one's going to be very short. And um, I just want to make sure that you have an easy to follow set of um, rules, if you like, to understand whether or not intoxication can be applied as a defence. And I'm going to start by looking at the what I've called the terms of reference. What do we mean? And essentially, when we talk about intoxic intoxication, we are talking about intoxication through drink, through drugs, and through solvents. And by solvents, sorry, I spot that wrong. By solvents, I mean glues and aerosols. And the idea behind that, of course, is that if you are so drunk that you cannot or do not know what you were doing, then you do not have the necessary mens rea. And if you don't have mens rea, you can't have criminal liability. We know that from our previous studies. So the I'm sure we've all been out on a sort of Saturday night and got so drunk that we don't know what happened and what, what we did. And certainly the following morning, we still can't remember what we did. If that's the case and you carry out a crime whilst you do not know, I know you are not in charge of your own mind, then you can't have the mens rea. Now, there's a problem with that, and the problem with that is this notion of public policy. In this country, we do not think it's right, we think it's wrong to allow intoxication as a, as a defence. And so therefore, what we do is a country, we've placed limits on its use, and we've limited the times at which it will be available as a defence. And we've done that by applying some general rules and guidelines as to what intoxication will be allowed as a defence to and what it won't. And that's what this first video is going to look at, is that what, what are those limits? What are the general rules? The second video will look at perhaps some of the more subtle elements and, and we'll look a bit deeper. But we'll start off with a general rule. And the general rule is that voluntary intoxication will only be a defence for specific intent crimes. And involuntary intoxication will always provide a defence for both basic and specific intent crimes. Now, there are some caveats, some extra things I need to say about that, and we'll do those in the second video. But just remember, voluntary intoxication, that where we choose to get drunk, will only be a defence for specific intent crimes. Involuntary intoxication, where we do not choose, somebody else chooses for us, or we do not know that we are getting drunk, will always provide a defence for basic and specific intent crimes. Now, that doesn't mean that they are automatically available. It means that people can use intoxication in order to plead a defence, and it will be up to the jury to decide whether or not that defence is um, allowed or otherwise. So, when you are asked a question as to whether or not somebody is intoxicated, I would suggest you go through these three questions in turn. The first question is, is the defendant intoxicated? Now that seems ridiculously stupid. Is the defendant intoxicated? And the case law for that is Kingston, 1994. And I'll cover Kingston in video two. But in short, if you are not intoxicated, you cannot claim the defence of intoxication. Seems ridiculously easy, doesn't it? So if not, the defence is not available. If you are intoxicated, then you move on to question two. And question two is about voluntary and involuntary intoxication. Is the intoxication involuntary, case law hardy, 1985, again I'll explain the facts of the case on the next video, or is it voluntary, Allen, 1988? You can see here, I've drawn, or I've put a picture up here, which is somebody spiking, I presume, these two girls' drinks. That would be involuntary intoxication. Those girls do not know that they are having their drinks spiked. They will drink them and they will not know of the effects that are caused because they did not take the drugs voluntarily. So if the drugs or the drink is taken involuntary, then the defence becomes available. You can apply, you can argue the defence of intoxication and we'll look at when that's available and when it's not later. 
If it's voluntary, however, that is you decide, you choose to drink to excess, we then move on to the next question. And the next question says, is the offence one of basic or specific intent crimes? If it is basic intent, the defence is not available. If it is specific intent, the defence is available. It may be available. The key case law here is Majewski, 1977. And Majewski is a key case. What happens in Majewski is the defendant is drinking in a pub. He's taken drinking drugs all day and subsequently assaults three people in a fight that's in the pub. A police officer is called and he assaults the police officer. He's arrested, he's taken back to the police station, where he assaults another two police officers in the police station. His defence was that he'd been drinking and taking drugs, and therefore had no intention to commit the acts which he did. His conviction, however, was upheld. Uh, the defendant's intoxication was the result of his own voluntary reckless act, um, which is according to the House of Lords, and that the trial judge had rightly directed the jury that they were to ignore it in considering whether he had formed the necessary mens rea in a crime of basic intent. And this case made the distinction between crimes of basic intent and crimes of specific intent. And I go back to that phrase that the House of Lords said, which was, um, the defendant's intoxication was the result of his own voluntary reckless act. Voluntary reckless act. And the key word here is reckless. Because in cases of basic intent, they can be committed through recklessness. And the idea is, is that if you have voluntarily become drunk, you are being reckless. And therefore, you fulfil enough intent for a basic intent crime. If it's a specific intent crime, of course, you can only commit that through intention, whether that be direct or indirect. You cannot commit it recklessly. And so therefore, if you do not have the mens rea, you cannot be guilty. In basic intent crimes, you have the mens rea of recklessness because you have voluntarily and recklessly decided to get drunk. So that's the basic rule. Let me go through it again. Is the defendant intoxicated? If they are, then you can look at the next step. If they're not, then the defence is not available. If they are intoxicated, you then have to ask, is the intoxication involuntary or voluntary? If it is voluntary, the defence is available straight away. If it's voluntary and they've chosen to drink, then we go to the third question, which is, is it a crime of basic or specific intent? If it is a basic intent crime, recklessness can be used to prove guilt. If it's a specific intent crime, then the defence may be available. OK, so that's the first of our videos. Nice and short. That's the easy part of intoxication done. What we'll do in the next short video is we'll look at perhaps what we mean by voluntary, what we mean by involuntary, and what happens when we mix drink intoxication with some other defences like insanity.